I am excited that next week uh, Jonathan Strasser will be bringing the word in my absence and uh, you will want to be here. Uh, I, know, I know that you'll be blessed uh, by Jonathan speaking next week. Well, you may have heard the story of the, the boy who went to uh, his dad and said, Dad, where, do, where did I come from? And uh, so the dad thought it was about time, and so he commenced to talking to his son about the birds and the bees for the next 10 minutes or so. And, and the boy looked at him kind of with wide eyes and, and said, well, that's weird. Uh, Bobby's from Texas, and I was just wondering where I come from. And I I don't know where you were when you heard about the birds and the bees or, or even if that conversation uh, ever took place or not, but uh, today I want to bring us into this part of our series as we're talking about marriage, family, sex, and the gospel. And uh, I was struck this week as I read about uh, a, a lady named Jane Brown, who's a professor of journalism and an expert on mass media, social influence, and she says that there's five main storylines about sex in our culture today. And, and, and in these storylines, these are, are stories that we are telling ourselves, and they are designed really to, to keep sex in front of us uh, all the time. And the first storyline is this, is that Men are sex-driven. The second storyline is this, is that women are sex objects. The third storyline is that appearance is paramount in dating. The fourth storyline that Jane points out is that dating is a game that has to be played. And then the fifth storyline is that sex is not that big of a deal. And so it's interesting, she also notes and points out that there seems to be this, this counter message going on. On the one hand, she makes this observation that society is saying that sex is not that big of a deal, but then on the other hand, it should be the main driving force of our lives. And these are, are the stories that we are, we are telling ourselves. And it's really leading to some very tragic chapters in our lives, and it's affecting every age and every stage of life this is not just a message for young people this is not just a message for single people or or married people or or senior people this, this is this is a message for all of us every one of us in this room and and so as as we reflect on the word today i i, I want us to to dig deep and and to to really have an open mind of of really asking this question that society and culture is placing upon us every day, and that is, is, is sex just merely an appetite? You know, we, we, uh, we read in, in different literature and history that in the days of Jesus, physicians in the Roman Empire would often diagnose women uh, with depression and, and hysteria, and they would diagnose it and then claim that it could be cured by frequent intercourse because sex is just an appetite. Matter of fact, Dr. Rufus, who was a physician in the Roman Empire, prescribed sex to adolescents for melancholy, epilepsy, and headaches. As you can imagine, there was a pretty long line out Dr. Rufus's door from adolescents coming to see him. And this is nothing new. There's nothing new under the sun. This has been, been happening for years and years. But even if sex is just an appetite, we know that when it comes to eating and drinking, that we, we need boundaries, that we need discipline, that we need self-control. I experienced this just last night in eating a whole Little Caesars pizza and let me recommend, do not eat a whole liter Little Caesars pizza before you preach on Sunday. It is just not a wise decision. But we know this even, even in the, the decisions that we make relating to eating and drinking. But, but I believe, church, that the Word of God points us to sex being more than just an appetite. 
that according to the wisdom of Scripture, sex affects your heart and your spirit and not just your body. So in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4, we read that marriage should be honored by all and the marriage bed kept pure. And I love how one translation says it. it says that honor marriage and guard the sacredness of sexual intimacy between wife and husband. Now the reality is, is that we get a lot of bad information about sex even early on in life, from bathroom walls to billboards to TV to social media to YouTube videos, we get a lot of bad information along the way. And for some of us, maybe it's that we've gotten some bad theology about sex along the way. Maybe we've been told or it's been interpreted by us that that sex is bad or it's dirty or it's not to be talked about in the church and and I've got news for you and for me as well that if we aren't willing to talk about it I guarantee you the world is more than willing to educate your children and your grandchildren for you and so I want to I want to invite us to this this conversation invite us to to this exploration of What is it that that God's Word says about sex? And I want to show you in God's Word today that that in the marriage relationship, sex is not bad. And, And sex is not just good. Sex is not just great. Sex is sacred. And that's a message that you will not hear anywhere else this week. I can, I can pretty much guarantee it. You, will, you can flip on your favorite TV show. You can go to your favorite website. You can talk. I guarantee you that's not a message that you will be hearing this week. The sacredness of sex. But there is something profoundly spiritual about sex. And it's the storyline that the rest of the world is avoiding. And so I beg you to don't, don't close your ears today, and, 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 but rather open up your heart and open up your mind to the Word of God. And so if you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to open to Genesis chapter 2 and verse 24. This is what the Word says in the creation story, that a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. And so you notice up here on the stage that I have a dry erase board that I've brought with me today. And, and so some of you appreciate math and some of you don't. But today I, I want to have a little, a little insight into God's math. And we just, we just read this, this first one that we're going to talk about, and it's God's subtraction. So I'm going to write this on the board today, and, and hopefully you can, you can see it, but if you cannot, I will be telling you what I'm writing on the board, and so you can jot this down in your notes as well. But God's subtraction is this, is that 3 minus 1 equals unity. We just read that, that for this reason, a man is, is going to, to leave his father and mother, that there, there's this subtraction that takes place, but it's not just subtraction for subtraction's sake, because once he leaves his father and mother, he is united. So three minus one equals unity. But we also have God's addition, and God's math is not like our math. And God's addition says that one plus one equals one. That the two shall become one flesh. And this defies all kinds of of thinking and logic to how can two become one. We talked about two weeks ago that 
that this is not two half people being made to be a whole person, that that's not what, that's not what this is saying, but that we also have to look at not just God's subtraction, not just God's addition, but also God's geometry. I was never great at geometry. But what, what we read in, in Scripture is this idea of you have the husband, you have the wife, and the husband has his own identity. He has some passions and some, some gifts and some talents, and the wife has her identity as well. She has some passions and some gifts and some talents, and they may not be the same, but that they are united, that there is this oneness that occurs because of one person and one person alone, and that is Christ. And so this union takes place in Christ. And as, as a husband and as a wife pursue Christ together, they grow closer to one another in that triangle. But there also needs to be a rectangle around this marriage covenant. And these are the boundaries that exist in marriage. These are, are the rules, the, the, the intentionality that, that we create in the marriage covenant. You know, affairs do not happen overnight. I've never met with a couple, nor have I counseled with a couple that says, you know what, we're about to get married, we can't wait to have an affair. It just doesn't happen overnight. You don't enter into marriages that way. It happens a little bit over a time, and you begin to erase boundaries here. You begin to erase boundaries there. You begin to erase some more boundaries. As a matter of fact, in our society today, there is a website that has over 40 million users that was just recently exposed this summer. And the website's tagline is, Life is short, have an affair. Over 40 million users on this website. And so what I want to encourage us to do in this, these, these three things that I'm going to have you write down, that I'm going to write on the board here, and this really goes for all of us, but, but in particular in the, in the marriage covenant, that we are to pursue Christ together. That when we are pursuing Christ together, that we are actually growing closer to one another. The second one is this, that we have to protect our marriage together. And this goes for all of us in this room, that, that yes, we, we honor marriage, we honor singleness, we honor both of those, and we help hold one another accountable in those situations, those, those seasons of life. And the third one may be one of the most important ones, is that we pray together. And so as we think about God's subtraction, God's addition, God's geometry, and, and even these three things, and, and praying together is, is one of those things that I even encourage dating couples to, to be careful with, because there is, this, there is this physical oneness that can take place, there is this emotional oneness that can take place, but the, the deepest oneness that we will experience in this life is spiritual oneness. So sometimes I'll even tell dating couples to have an escape plan if you're praying together. And I encourage dating couples to pray together. But you need to have a fire escape plan. Because if you are not operating out of your plans, you will be operating out of your glands, right? Some of you never heard that, but that's a good one. You might want to write that down. And as... As we look at God's Word, we, we see this, this picture un unfold that is, is actually something that, that Paul talks about quite powerfully in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 when he was writing to believers in Corinth who were still connecting with area prostitutes. 
And in verse 16, he said, Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her body? For it is said, the two will become one flesh. And what, what Paul is acknowledging is that sex carries with it this spiritual and emotional freight. But we as a society and a culture largely don't understand this today. And that's when we engage in sex, our body's making a promise whether we realize it or not. And we feel the effects as human beings. We, we hear this term, uh, friends with benefits, which refers to casual sex without the promise of commitment or covenant but you and I know that that doesn't work for very long and we we won't buy a car we won't even give a loan or we won't take out a mortgage we won't even start a new cell phone plan without some kind of binding promise without somebody else signing on the dotted line and promising their commitment but we will open up our bodies and use other people's bodies outside of ever having an oath or a promise, and yet our bodies and our hearts really know better. And sex is meant to express a covenant that's been made. But when the sex is there without the covenant, it can be confusing because our bodies made a promise already, and this is why we start feeling that the other person belongs to us and, the, and that we belong to the other person. And even though a covenant hasn't been made, your heart is operating this way because you're made in the image of God, and this is how he created you. And God created things to be divinely ordered. He created things in such a way that sex is far more than just an appetite. See, folks, the bloodhound gang had it all wrong. We are more than just any other mammal on the Discovery Channel. We're more than that. And sex is more than that. And this is God's idea. I wish I could claim that, hey, this is my, per this, is, this is God's idea. Isn't it interesting and curious in Genesis 4, verse 1, that the first thing Scripture records Adam and Eve doing after being kicked out of the Garden of Eden is Adam made love to his wife. And she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. She said, with the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. Have you ever caught that phrase before in Scripture? with the help of the Lord. That God does not leave the room when a husband and a wife engage one another. That God intended sex to be this powerful, pleasurable experience for two people in a marriage covenant. Just read the book of Song of Solomon. You will see Scripture describes the woman of being equal dignity and not just being an object. That sexual intimacy, as God intended it, is good. It's his idea. He created it. But often culture describes sex in terms of individual fulfillment. It's often referred to in, in terms of what you get out of it and how you are pleased by it. And look in Ephesians chapter 5, starting in verse 1. It says, follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love. Just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But among you, there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality or any kind of impurity or of greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. For of this you can be sure. No immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a person as an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Isn't it interesting that, that Paul, when he's talking about this, sins, that he, he aligns greed and sexual immorality right next to each other, and I think it's because greed is connected to sexual immorality. We're, we're looking to get, and we can be greedy for more than just money. We're greedy for pleasure. We can even be greedy for validation. 
You, you hear about, we talk about the night that he became a man or the night that he became a woman. And what are we doing? We're equating sexual experience and sexual fulfillment with a sense of validation as a mature human being. And before you know it, sex is about proving something about ourselves. It's about serving you. It's about pleasing you. It's about validating you. And when that happens, it begins to turn other people into vehicles for our fulfillment. People become objects. One of the pieces of propaganda that was used by the Nazis in World War II was this piece that broke down the human and ju just into physical components. And so it made statements like, the human body contains enough fat to make seven cakes of soap. The human body contains enough iron to make a medium-sized nail. And by reducing the sacredness of human beings to physical components, they were able to, to justify doing horrible things during that time. And that's what's going on with pornography. That's what's going on with prostitution and sex trafficking. That we are reducing folks to just what they can do for us. And all these are telling us something. They're, they're telling us that we, we only want a part of a person that gratifies us. And my friends, the gospel says that their whole self is worth dying for. Every part of them. The whole self. The gospel says that they are worth laying down one's life for. And when sexual expression is seen as simply a matter of individual fulfillment, it turns us into users and consumers. It's all about getting without any promise of exclusivity or commitment. And so you have recreational sex. You have casual sex. You even have safe sex. But church, I want to ask us today, what about sacred sex? That this sacred sex is rooted in the gospel. It's rooted in the Jesus story. That this vision for, for sex the way God intended it and being a disciple of Jesus is about learning to live with a different vision, the vision of Jesus for every aspect of our lives, including matters of sex and sexual intimacy. And is it possible that we as a church who profess to be believers in Jesus Christ have in some ways practically become sexual atheists? That we believe that we're going about dealing with our sexuality and our desires as if God doesn't exist and as, as though he's not even spoken about the topic. We haven't allowed Jesus and the rest of Scripture to shape how we view sex, to shape how we carry out an open dialogue. Two weeks ago, we looked at Jesus' words in Matthew 19, verse 4 and verse 5. Jesus said, haven't you read? He replied that at the beginning, the Creator made them male and female, and said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. That there's this divine order that's being laid out. And if you're still taking notes, I want you to jot these, these three things down as we reflect on, on sacred sex and the importance of, of having a conversation as a family about such matters. And the first one is this, is that sacred sex recognize the sacredness of every person. That there is, is not just this appetite that I just want part of somebody, that I just want this one part to fulfill me, but know that this is a whole person, that there is a sacredness to every person, that the gospel speaks to the wholeness of life. And if a person is not willing to lay down their life for another person, then they are not ready to lay down with that person. Sacred sex recognizes the sacredness of every person. I read an article this week in the Washington Post. It says, the title was, I love my boyfriend, but I never want to get married. 
And the article says, we've been together four years and we both made it clear that we're not interested in matrimony, holy or otherwise. If it's not a priority for either of us, if I'm not invested in becoming his wife and the cultural baggage that entails, then why do it? Church, please listen to me and write this down. Sacred sex is rooted in the marriage covenant. And when sacred sex is rooted in the marriage covenant, it provides the security necessary for vulnerability for the long haul. I've heard many couples describe that sexual intimacy was richer the further along that they got in years. And Laney and I would be frank enough to admit that this is the case in our own marriage covenant. And I think that this has something to do with, with the feeling of being safer and more secure with each other as time goes by and learning to give one another grace and learning how to relate to each other in this way. And you know, there have been times with two kids and stressful seasons of life where this area was lacking and it was uncomfortable and it was awkward to talk about, but we did. And in fact, we reached out for prayer and for marriage coaching, and over time, we had a a breakthrough. And there are are times when this area in marriage requires work and counsel and prayer and even awkward conversation, but it's worth it. It's worth it. But at the heart of it and what gives it stability to work on it and have these conversations is a covenant with one another and a covenant that we have in Christ that's the heart this last one number three sacred sex is more about the giving of oneself than the taking of another and this this is a powerful reminder because it's what Paul says in first Corinthians 13 about what what love is that love is not self-seeking And we need the support. We need the accountability of other people. Whether you're a student, whether you're single, whether you're married, whether you're widowed, whether you've been abused, whether you suffered with an addiction to pornography. Church, we have to be a place where we can talk about these things, where we can pray for one another, where we can hear testimonies from one another, and where we can draw strength from one another in God's spirit. We need support. We need healing. We need accountability. And that's why we need the gospel. Marriage, family, sex, and the gospel. In 1 Corinthians 6, Paul says, The sexually immoral will not inherit the kingdom of God. But in the very next sentence, I want you to catch what he says. And that is what some of you were. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. And there's no arena of sexuality, no arena that's untouchable by God's grace. There's no arena of sexuality that's out of bounds of being redeemed. This is a tough message, church, but I believe it's such an important message that's rooted in the gospel that every life is sacred, that sacred sex exists inside this marriage covenant. And and that that sacred sex is more about giving than it is about taking of another. So I want to ask you this morning, with with every head bowed and every eye closed, for us to take a moment to come before a, a holy God and first and foremost to recognize that we have fallen short and we're like Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 6 where he says woe is me for I 
and a ruined life. But he makes that bold proclamation, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And so this morning I want to invite you to to pray a prayer. For some of us, every head bowed, every eye closed, I want to invite you to just to pray this prayer. God, we need your grace. God, we confess that we have fallen short in the area that we have spoken about today. Whether it be our thoughts, whether it be our passivity and the way we've not talked about it, whether it be specific situations or sins, Guys, we just confess those to you right now and we lay those before your throne of grace this morning. God, for some of us, we're grateful for those words. That is what you once were. Thank you for the gospel. Thank you for the redeeming grace of Jesus Christ. God, I pray today that we will receive that grace in our lives and that we will offer to you a new life that's only made new in Jesus Christ and by the power of his Holy Spirit. So God, I pray that you will do that in us right now, which we cannot manufacture or do ourselves that you will make all things new. God, that we will receive that message of grace this morning, that we will boldly proclaim the gospel in every area of our lives, whether it's our married life, our single life, the sex life, whatever it is, God, that we will boldly proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ and the wholeness that he brings through the blood that he shed on our behalf. God, we give you this time, we give you this day. We thank you for speaking to our hearts directly. It's in Jesus, amen. If you need uh, additional prayers from this church, if you would like one of the shepherds to pray over you, there'll be a shepherd down front. There'll also be a shepherd back here in this chapel. If today's the day that you want to receive Jesus Christ and be baptized into him, we invite you to that too. We're here to walk alongside you. If you have a need, will you come as we stand? Sing the song. My Lord, what love is this that pays so dearly that I, the guilty. 